Well, first of all, I'd love to welcome you to St. Peter's Woodlands. Dr. Richard, all the way from Harvard University. It's very exciting to have you. Uh, I talk about the fact that in 2012, I was lucky enough to go through the Cultures of Thinking training. And I still say it's, a, it's the PD that totally revolutionised what teaching looked like in my classroom. It was like the penny dropped. And uh, it's almost, I can, I can remember just that, that being an absolute turning point for my children and what was happening. So when I became principal, I can remember thinking that one of the things that I would like for every teacher here is to also have the opportunity to do that training. So it's, it's wonderful to have you. But when explaining to the parent community what Project Zero is all about and the fact that it encourages children to think in the classroom, you can imagine parents and, and the community would be thinking, well, surely that's obvious. Surely children are already thinking in classrooms. What would your response be to that? Of course, teachers have always wanted students to think, and we've always known that thinking is an important component of learning. But we haven't often given teachers kind of the tools of how is it that we support the thinking. We've kind of left it a little bit to chance in many instances. So sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. We expect some kids maybe they're act naturally kind of inclined towards that. But when we talk about kind of making thinking visible, we really want that for every child. We want to really develop their understanding about what thinking is and how they are developing as a thinker and a learner so that they develop the strategies for thinking and they also develop the dispositions for thinking. And so what that means is that it's not only the student can think, but they do think, that they actually carry that, that they develop that sense of kind of curiosity taking into the world. And so those are the things that we're trying to really elevate um, in the classroom to make sure that it's a really central component of a classroom rather than something that's just kind of left to chance. Absolutely. Recently, we uh, surveyed our parents and asked them what kinds of dispositions would you like your students and skills would you like your students to graduate from SPW with? And as you would imagine, nobody really had the ability to memorise and regurgitate facts. That wasn't high on the list of priorities. So what kinds of dispositions does Project Zero and Visible Thinking really encourage in students? Well, we talk a lot about kind of two, what I call kind of master dispositions. And they're master dispositions because there's a lot of research on them that how important they are. They're important to students in school, but they're also important to students in life. Things that really contribute to our long-term success. And those two dispositions are curiosity and metacognition. So that disposition to be metacognitive, to be aware of your thinking, to be able to direct your thinking. And so those are two that we really put a lot of emphasis on. So developing that curiosity, we want students to wonder, to question, to identify puzzles, to actually engage deeply. And what we know about curiosity is that when students are curious, it actually creates more engagement, which makes learning easier. And it also makes learning stick. Yeah. And that's what we want. Lots of research on curiosity has also shown that curiosity leads people to be more successful in their jobs and in life. And curiosity also leads us to be happier in life. And happiness is also something that many parents kind of want for their, their child. So I often call curiosity and metacognition kind of the master dispositions. So if we were the kind of school that really had embraced this way of, uh, of teaching and learning in our classrooms, what might it look like to, if you're walking around classrooms compared to perhaps what traditional school looked like for a lot of our parents and community members, what might they expect to see happening in our classrooms? Well, you might not, you might, but you might not see the teacher at the front of the room. You'd see the teacher moving around a lot more. You'd probably see students a lot more engaged in discussion and not just talking, but actually discussion around ideas. And so we talk about engagement as kind of having three components, engagement with ideas, engagement with others, and engagement in action. And so you would see conversations around all of those kind of types of engagement. You'd also see students kind of digging into the content in a way that really builds understanding. So rather than being a kind of a surface level, which schools traditionally have been, you know, oh, we just need to get this information across for the test. Um, the problem with that is that information doesn't stick very long. It's not that information is unimportant, but if we treat it as just kind of a superficial thing, it might stay with students long enough for the test 
and then disappear. But when we build understanding, we're not neglecting knowledge, but we're helping the student to connect that knowledge in a way that makes it more usable. It also makes it easier to retain, makes it easier to apply. And so all of those things you might kind of see in a classroom. You might also see, you know, what's up on the wall might look different rather than, you know, just copies of student work, you know, perhaps even every student the same, their paper, you would see student thinking you'd see work in progress. It might look a little bit messier because the ideas are being developed, but the teachers are using you know, the walls of the classroom, the environment of the classroom as kind of a third teacher, as a resource for their teaching and for student learning. So there would be a different kind of buzz, a different kind of activity, much more grounded in ideas, grounded in the thinking and the long-term learning. Fantastic. So at the moment, we've got you here over four days, which is very exciting. Our teachers getting and the opportunity to step outside of their classroom and do two days of, of training mm -hmm. with you, which is fantastic. But we're talking about partnering with you in, in the long term, which is something that excites mm -hmm. me greatly. So in subsequent visits, what kinds of things might you be doing with the school and what kinds of things would you be hoping that you're seeing? Obviously, what you were just describing there in, in the change of what's going on in the classrooms, but what might that partnership Look like. A couple of different ways. Of course, we need to bring <laughs> that together about what serves the needs of the teachers. But because culture of thinking is not a program, it's not this package thing that we've kind of got this rolled out. We've got lots of ideas about what we know supports. And these first two days, we've had the opportunity, two days with one group of teachers, two days with another group of teachers, to really engage and explore these ideas initially. Often future visits to schools look like is, are much more classroom-based. So we're beginning to go into classrooms, working with teachers around strategies for making the thinking visible, using what we call thinking routines, helping them plan for that. Sometimes going into classrooms, really beginning to kind of look at the culture of the classroom and develop that. So we're really wanting to now kind of embed these ideas in a way that helps teachers to kind of see them in their practice. Um, and not just kind of as a toolkit or a quick set of practices, but a real, again, depth of understanding. Fantastic. So Dr. Richard, what part can parents and caregivers play in encouraging their children to really be thinkers? In order to develop it as thinkers, we need models of thinking. So I always encourage parents to make their own thinking visible. So when they've got a problem to solve, when they're reading something, when they're watching television, make their thought process visible. They're asking questions, they're, they're puzzling about things, they're reflecting on problems they've solved. Those wind up being models for our children. So they, we want to have them see us engaged in the thinking. Another thing is, you know, we share our thinking when we know that the other people are interested yeah. in our thinking. So when parents take an interest, not just in, you know, the child's activity, but actually in their thinking. So that often means lots of follow-up questions. And the one kind of simplest follow-up question for parents is um, the question, what makes you say that? Yeah. So when a student is given a response, their child has said something, just follow up with a simple, well, what makes you say that? in a genuine kind of curious tone because you're interested in where that idea came from. And you'll be surprised at how much new information and new insights into your child's thinking come just from that one simple question. That's actually a very incredibly powerful question you to mm. use as a teacher in the classroom. Absolutely. And that was one of the questions that I came away mm. with back in 2012 yeah. and mm -hmm. astounding how that one question could just start off this beautiful, rich dialogue. And so to be using mm -hmm. it as a parent or a caregiver to really uh, mm -hmm. delve into um, you know, their children's thinking, I think it also shows that we, we're wanting to, to go beyond those surface answers. You know, how was your day? What did you learn? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I love that idea. Well, well what makes you say that? Mm -hmm. It really shows that genuine interest in what's right. going on in your, in your child's mm -hmm. mind and, and those thinking processes. Mm -hmm. I also like the idea of, of speaking out loud when you're thinking yeah. to, to show and demonstrate to your child that you know, these are the processes mm -hmm. that we go through internally. So making those right. you know, external for the children mm -hmm. to listen to and learn from is just mm -hmm. two very simple things that we can do as parents and caregivers. So thank you for yeah. that. Now, of course, you're visiting South Australia and I know you've been here before, but uh, there's a couple of things that I, I need to give you because if you come to South Australia, uh. okay, you need to experience uh, good wine. We're yes. renowned for good wineries. Right. I've only been here a year and a half myself yeah. and I'm, I'm making it my personal mission to visit them all. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then there's another 
fantastic company called Hague's uh, and it's a great South Australian chocolate. So they're my just favourite Australian things. Fantastic. Right so it's just a little chocolate. welcome gift. Thank you for spending time with us at mm. SPW. We're so excited to have you and uh, I really look forward to our partnership over the coming years. So thank, thank you so you. much.